So, to come to the topic of today, the demise of Khoiko languages in southern Africa, um, in 1670, remember the key date, Van Ruyck arrived in 1652, right? that's where the Dutch uh, activities started here. So in 1670, 18 years later, that was also after Van Ruyck's time, he was only here for 10 years, uh, there is not ready. All right. After the arrival of the Dutch, the Chamber of Seventeens of the Dutch East India Company. If you switch it off entirely, can we can we just test whether you can hear me if I switch off entirely? No, um, you have to speak with the. You have to. Yeah. You're not I'm recording. Me. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Please say if it's. And not comfortable. All right. So, 18 years after the arrival of the Dutch, a sailing vessel was dispatched up the west coast here with a brief to explore the coast from the Cape up to the Tropic of Capricorn, that is just south of Waterfish Bay uh, in Namibia, and to investigate how far the settlements of Ikoikoi, which were then already referred to as Hottentots or Hottentours, extended to the north. And I want to say at this stage, please get me right, when I use the word Hottentot, I quote the term in historic context. I'm not using the word as an insult. Please don't get me wrong on that, right? And I'm not using a certain pronunciation which is definitely derisive. Okay. So, to explain, to um, investigate how far the Khoi Khoi extended to the north on the west coast, they turned back from Sandwich Harbor after a brief first and rather unfortunate encounter because they um, uh, came to some conflict with the Khoi Khoi at Sandwich Harbor. It's Sandwich Harbor. Sandwich Harbor. That is south of Bay. So, Professor, who dispatched it? Well, the, 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 the then manager of the um, Cape Settlement, the refreshment settlement, of the um, um, Dutch East India Company. Please, if you have questions for clarification, do ask me right away, otherwise you're lost. If you have um, opinion or anything like that, keep it for afterwards, please, otherwise I won't finish. <laughs> All right? So, um, seven years after that, in 1677, Another vessel was dispatched to explore the Libyan coast up to the Portuguese territory in Angola, north of the Kunene River. That was the area uh, Bengela, Moshamedes. And because they again wanted to see what the habitat and the way of life of the Koiko is, and of course, in explore possibilities to trade sheep, cattle, uh, sheep and cattle, and after all, also slaves at that stage. Um, because the replenishment station in the Cape needed that to provide for the, for the ships that went east to the Indies. Now, some koi koi from the Cape, koi koi means now button dots, all right? If you're not familiar with the terms, I will explain these terms as we go on. Some koi koi, were included on this second expedition, and it is reported that they had difficulties in communicating with the Khoi Khoi encountered at various places, ranging from Ludris to Sandwich Harbor. But they could, in a way, communicate. And it is also reported that between the 15th and the 14th degree of southern latitude, that is the area of Namibe in southwestern Angola, uh, the territory of the Koiko ends and that of, quote, Kaffirs begins. That means Bantu. You know that Kaffir was also an officially used name in publications for Kosa. Yeah. Um, now, as scanty and as superficial as this little information is, these diaries from the late 17th century uh, provide information which is valuable today for two reasons. Firstly, that these Khoi Khoi from the Cape could, in a way, communicate uh, with those local Khoi Khoi up there, albeit with difficulty. 
so this means that there was a, that there was a language continuum, as it is called, dialect to dialect, from the Cape up to Angola. That's over 2,000 kilometers. Now, south of the Sahara, where you have Arab languages and so on, that is an immense area, 2,000 kilometers, uh, for one and the same language continuum. I'll come back to that later on. The second point was that this information that they could communicate in Angola uh, is not verifiable any longer after the Angolan Civil War with the Portuguese, as the Kwadi who were there uh, do not live there any longer. Today you get, at the utmost, you get some number in the world who sit in Kroger land in America. Right, now we come to nomadic fiction. I want to explain some of the terms. Who were or who are these Khoikhoi speakers? Um, and before we come to the linguistic subgroupings and the linguistic classification, I just want to work the way down from the widest terms. The first ones are Bantu and Khoisan. Um, we all know that here in South Africa, Bantu was used on, in the apartheid days as a term for Africans, black Africans, for black people, which was a wrong use. I'll come to that. Now, um, the philologist Wilhelm Blick, he was German, not Blake. Uh, Wilhelm Blick was since 1856 translator for Sir George Gray, the governor of the Cape. And since 1862, he was the first curator of the um, Sir George Gray Library, which was then opened as Sir George Gray himself left South Africa. And he had received a PhD for a dissertation written in Latin, mind you, where he argued for the North African origin of the so-called modern ones. North African origin. This is history now. We don't believe that today, okay? But I think it's easier to lead you into the present classification by starting with those ways. Um, now, Hamitic languages, that was a term for all non Semitic, i.e., Arabic and Hebrew and so on, non Semitic gender languages which had sex gender. That would be something like Old Egyptian, which is extinct. <coughs> Uh, Berber and Cushitic languages, all from North Africa. And he was arguing that the Hottentot languages, uh, language is, is related to that, that means they would have had to migrate all the way down. Now, in Cape Town, when he started working here, he was first translator of the Zulu Bible in Natal. He started an investigation of the local languages. And that is Bantu and so called Hottentot. And in 1862, he brought out a book that was the first one, a comparative grammar of South African languages. And there he demonstrated that these languages, these so called Bantu languages, that would be something like Isizulu, Isikosa, Sisulu, Sitswana, Sipedi, Chivenda, and so on, that they had very similar grammars with this class system, the prefix and so on and uh, that they had uh, many words in their vocabulary which had the same origin. So he had to devise an artificial name for this group of languages, because not all languages here belonged to it. The Hottentot languages did not belong to it. Um, and he chose a word which appears in all of these languages in some form, and that is the word for people. And here you have some examples. Uh, you have the languages there, I don't have to read them all to you. But there you have um, Abantu for the Nguli language, is in Kosa, is in Zulu. Namibia, Antu, Setswana, Batu, and so on. That's not O, it's O. It's very close to U, okay? And you can see those red parts are the prefixes. And you can see some languages have got a disyllabic prefix, aba, and others just have ba, like these Sotho languages. 
And so he created, sorry, I'm stuck here. Okay. He created an artificial term. He used that word, but without the ah. So that was the name for the language family that he adopted. It's not a true word, because it should have been Abantu then, and he chose Bantu as it is here for that. Now this term Bantu, as Blake introduced there, was a perfectly legitimate term for this family of languages, or phylum as it can also be called. It is, it does not mean black person, or African as it was made to use here in, in the apartheid days. It might still be so that in South Africa, all Bantu speakers, Bantu is a linguistic term, not an ethnic term. All Bantu speakers are black, but not in Namibia, because the Damara are black. They are supposed to be closely related, not closely, but related genetically to the Ovaherero. You have them there. Both are black, and you can certainly not call a Damara a Bantu by any means, because he does not speak a Bantu language. He speaks a Koya language. That must be clear to you, all right? So whenever the word Bantu is used, it is just in a linguistic sense, never in an ethnic sense. Professor, one question. Yes. Any idea which year that uh, Zulu Bible was translated? It was before Blick came to, I further to tell him, but I didn't bother about it now. It was before he was, uh, came to Cape Town, it was around 1850. Um, if, if you want to know it exactly, contact me afterwards, I can look it up for you. All right. It is not relevant for today, therefore I didn't bother about it. Um, now, in his comparative grammar, Blake contrasted the Bantu languages with Kweko, with the Khoi languages that he found here in the Cape. And I just added this here, compare the word for people, just like all these, is coin. You can see it does not fit at all. This language has got a suffix, grammatical suffix for singular plural. Those have got prefixes, so they're definitely not related, mm -hmm. right? And he contrasted that. And this is uh, so he could delimit the languages which were not Bantu, and that was very clear that he had a family here, and he was the first Bantuist we can recognize. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, now, his daughter, Dorothea Blick, was honorary reader for Bushman languages at UCT from 1923 to 48 for 25 years. And she did extensive field work amongst the Bushmen. Blick had very frail health from a fever, uh, an infection which he got elsewhere in the tropics. And so he could not, he was too frail to do field work. And he could only work with whoever he got in Cape Town. And Dorothea Blake then subdivided the Bushman languages that he, she investigated into northern, central, and southern Bushman languages. Yeah. I will not go into the details because it's history now, okay? <coughs> and the Hottentots she considered to be a separate additional group. But Blake also had the problem that she confused sometimes linguistic and ethnic criteria. Because you have Bushmen who don't speak a Bushman language, we'll come to that. They speak a Goy language. All right. Now, therefore, Hottentot and Bushman languages were not considered to belong to the same phylum. But this thinking was changed by a zoologist, Leonard Schulz, a professor. Sorry? Don't take offense with that. Now I'm shocked like a uh, No, because you don't expect linguistics from him. And also he didn't say anything about linguistics. He was from the University of Jena, therefore he is very often quoted as Schulz Jena. He was commissioned by the German government, remember they had colonial interests up there in Deutsche Bistavita, in 1903 to study the scientific and commercial foundations of marine life at the West Coast. Now he himself, at his own request, had this commission extended to the study of the causal interrelations of the climate and topography of the interior and the fauna 
that is the animal life, right? And that he himself extended to the human fauna. That is, he studied the Nama and the Bushmen in the Kalahari. Therefore, his famous book, which still is a classic today, the best information we have on the Nama is Os Nama Land und Kalahari. Now, he also, as a zoologist, he was interested in the physical characteristics of these people, and he made uh, biometric uh, measurements uh, and, and published them in another book in 1928. And there he was convinced that the several Hottentots and the Bushmen were of the same race. All right, this is history. Uh, because of these phenotypical commonalities that they had. And in the search of a name again for this common race that he found, he followed the model of Blake and he tried to use the word for person or persons. So he had no problem with Hottentot because it's all Koi, that's the stem. And by the way, people, please don't ever use the Afrikaans pronunciation of OE, it's not Ku, it's not Kuhu Choba, as I hear. Uh, we come to the language, it's Hoi, Hoi, Toba. So he used, he wanted to create a term now for Hottentot plus Bushman. So he took Koi for the Koi languages, but he had a problem with the sound languages. There was not one word that he could use that appears in all the sound languages. So what he did, he used the Koi word for the sun, what they call them. We call that an exonym, and the people given from outside us, not the people themselves, not an Indian. Now the word of the Koi for the Bushman is the San. That means gatherers of felt pots. You know what felt pots is, food from the felt. Uh, uh, some people say, no, but this is wrong, can't be, because this is San. And the verb is sa, it's a different tone. Koiko verb is a tone language, all right? Now that is a regular rule how you derive nouns from the verbs, this tone switch that you have there. So it's definitely that what they are saying is the gatherers. So the term that he had then is koisan, that was his spelling there, more or less. Uh, if you are pedantic like me, you want the proper spelling OE because you don't get a combination of I and it should be double A really. But that's, it's a matter of taste, all right? We won't argue about that. So that's the term he created, Khoisan, for the race, not the language. This term is not accepted today any longer while I stand here. Today it's a term of convenience for any non-Bantu click language of Southern Africa. Because there are other click languages, there are Bantu click languages in South Africa. Is it Kosa? They can hear it. Zulu, Rutiriku and the Gavango, Ye and so on. Several, but they have borrowed through contact with the Korean the sound. All right? So we say non Bantu click languages, and we must say of South Africa, because Atta and Sandawe in, in East Africa, Kenya, and also. Um, uh, um, okay, what's your Cushitic language? Dalo, thank you. They also have clicks, a few. Questions, where did they get them from? So, as I say, Khoi San today, as one word, not Khoi and San and so on, is used by linguists for non Bantu click languages of South Africa. Right, that was that. Um, now, he brought out this term in 1928. Very soon after, in 1930, the anthropologist Isaac Shapira accepted that term and said there is a cultural unity, there's a kind of proto-culture and religion between the Khoi and the San. Uh, Isaac Shapira was UCT trained, if you want to hear that. He was a professor at Wits, then at UCT, and then the major part of his life at London School of Economics. Very important man in anthropology. He, he adopted that term for the culture. And in 1949, after the war, the German Africanist Dietrich Westermann 
used the term for a common linguistic family. He said the languages are also of the same origin. And Oswin Köhler, Professor Oswin Köhler, who is professor at Cologne University and the most important, most eminent pupil of Westermanns, he used that term also and claimed that on grammatical grounds, not on vocabulary, that is probably one family. So this is how the term uh, came into existence at the beginning of the 1950s. Right, now I want to come to you know now about how to use Khoisan, just as a term of convenience. Um, now I want to come to the linguistic classification of these Khoisan languages. In the 1950s, an American anthropologist and linguist, Joseph Greenberg, simplified the classification of African languages. We had a multitude of different small little families and so on. He simplified it and uh, sorry, yes, no, I want to do something else here. I must follow this one here. Yes. Anyway, let's let's carry on with uh, Greenberg first. He linked up the languages as classified, the Bushman languages as classified by Dorothea Blake were North, Central, and Southern Khoisan. Geographically, that was easy. And uh, separate from that, Hottentot. Now, Greenberg said the Hottentot languages belong to the Central group, and he called them now Central Khoisan. So he, from a linguistic point, he simplified that into one. Uh, 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 one phylum, as we call it, that is a macro family, a super family. Um, here are just briefly the, the uh, groups that he has. These gray ones here on top, up here, go actually into Asia Minor. Those are the Afro Asiatic languages. Then this one is called Nilo Saharan in the middle. Then you have this yellowish big group that is Niger, Congo, after the rivers, Niger and Congo. And the yellow part, all that, is Bantu languages. At least 500 languages today is the, num the number of languages that's traded. And this group here is what he called Khoisan. In other words, he simplified it to just four macro families. Now, that was very popular for the, the most important reason was probably because it was simple. It was very complicated before. But um, he was called, they called this the lumper approach. You take the different language families and lump them into bigger groups, right? Now, there were two groups then that you had, the lumpers and the splitters. <laughs> Amongst the Poissanists, the the major proponent of the lumpers was Oswin Kula from Cologne University. The splitter, main splitter, was Professor Ernst Westphal from UCT. This is how I knew him in his office in the old arts building, today the AC Jordan building. He was my professor. And Westphal said in several articles where he um, attacked Greenberg. He said that with the established methodologies of historical linguistics, historical comparative linguistics, you cannot establish regular sound correspondences uh, between different languages. I'll show you examples just now that in the one language, let's say in Oshiwambo, it is what is L is always R in Oshiherero and so on. You cannot do that, he said between Bushman and Khoi, mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, he rejected Greenberg's idea of a Khoisan file. Now, Khoisanists were very much in the two camps, the adherents of Köhler's Lampa uh, attitude and a few with Westphal in his splitter attitude. Now, um, Westphal made his statement on the grounds of his own fieldwork. He did a lot of fieldwork. 
at least in the initial years, when he was back here at UCT, he was at Sarah's before in London. And, uh, but Kühler's lumber stance was more popular, especially also because he had all the followers in Germany. And Westphal was largely overlooked. Greenberg never replied. He opted out of the whole debate. And uh, sadly, Westphal did not live to see that after his death in 1990, his splitter attitude was largely vindicated by a new generation of Kuesanists. Today, we believe what Westphal said, not what Kuehler said. This is a typical uh, title. Gildemann is one of the leading Khoisanists now. He called it beyond Khoisan, beyond the Khois concept of Khoisan. You can see what the title says, right? Now, here I give you just a summary of the arguments. Uh, this is a tripartite uh, table. That is Greenberg. His Khoisan family, one big family of Philo. The Northern Khoisan, Central Khoisan, Southern Khoisan. Here you have the same groups maintained still, but as separate families. That is what now I believe now. Ka, that is languages like Jun, Tonazik, Kung, and so on, Bushman languages, right? Uh, it's called now with not Jew any longer because Ka, there is another language, Amkoi, which is in central Botswana, which was linked up there. So you need a super category. Then the central Khoisan is called Khoi, Kwadi, Kwadi. We're not so interested in that's the extinct language in southwestern Angola, which we said we can't find any longer. Westphal had investigated it and that was it. But there you have, again, you have in the, amongst the Khoi branches, uh, languages, you have two. You have Khoi Khoi and you have Kalahari Khoi. The Khoi branch that was Cape Khoi, all these square brackets mean is extinct now. Kora and Khri or Khrikwa which you will be familiar with. There is Khoi Kogova, <coughs> excuse me, spoken by the Nama, the Damara, the Hainkon, the Akwe in Namibia. That is the main living language today, Khoi Kogova. Amongst the Kalahari Khoi languages, you have, again, a division in between East and West. Don't be intimidated by all these different names. You will not be able to memorize them, so I just want to give you the principles, all right? Here is the map again. Um, first of all, the Kha languages are these yellow ones. Here you have Jun, Twa, and Ku. The in Angola, Ku, these are traditional uh, um, territories. You don't get them like this any longer. After the Angola civil wars, these Ku came down. Some settled in Namibia, some are now here in, uh, in near Kimberley, settled in Ted Camps, and so on. You have. Um, now the brown group is the Khoi group. That is Kwadi up there, okay, which is now out. This is Damara in the north, Nama in the south of Namibia, the Hainkom. The Hainkom are actually ethnically considered to be San. I don't agree because they gradually, they're more, they're like uh, San like in the east, and the more they get to the Damara side, they become poor and uh, Negroid. And the Akwe also, which used to live in the former Uvangulat. This is the uh, Botswana side of it, e Eastern and Western languages. We don't have to go into detail. Now this yellowish part here, that is uh, what was the former Southern Khoisan, is the two languages. They are extinct, except for this one group here, amongst the Ta. Uh, I'll show you a better map of Kulas just now. But this is all these languages in South Africa are gone now, except for the Khoi languages here in the Rechtesfeld. And you have a few here in, in Botswana also. So those are basically the languages. Let's just go to that quickly. This is how it's divided nowadays. I want to say something about the terms Bushman and San. Uh, many people reproach people who use the word Bushman and say this is pejorative, say some. 
Now remember what I told you about the term Zion, it means gatherer or felt force. This was the name that the hands who had cattle and sheep, the koi, used for their have nots. So it's not less pejorative if they are pejorative. The additional problem that people have, first of all, the speakers and people who know a bit about the language like me, the word sam is, um, let me just get back here, here. Um, the M on sam is really the plural suffix, like in koin or sam. This is the singular koib, a male person, koes, a female person, koi, any person neuter. Someone. In other words, if you speak to somebody and say, or well, I tell you, I spoke to a son, that's ungrammatical, because son is plural. Or if you ask somebody and say, are you a son? Ouch. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. You understand? You should then say, if you speak Nama, you should say, are you a Sats? Or if it's a woman, are you a Sats? Because the stem is only Sats. Therefore, I don't use the word Sa, I use Bushman. Because basically they are equally pejorative or not. But some people call themselves Bushmen. Themselves? Yes. yes, they do. They ask the communities um, what they would like to be called. There was one for instance, the Penduka Declaration, early after the 2000. And uh, some people, I think in Botswana, they say it's Han and so on. Others again say Bushmen and so on. Um, I've now read something about Lake Cruising when he claimed me there. The last country speaker was supposed to be, uh, was murdered in 1998, something like that. Or even a little bit earlier. Now they've found more Bushmen there. They say, Ebis Bushma. Yeah. But they don't speak the language. They speak Afrikaans or Bosnian. Yeah. All right? And they've been hiding at the lake all the time, ever since because they were always suppressed by other communities. So either term is a right or not a right. Now just the two more terms, the word koi koi and koi kukuba, let me also explain that. Um, koi, as I said, means person. Now koi koi, this is what I will talk about tomorrow. How did we get to the name koi kukuba? Uh, koi koi means it's a doubling. You get it sometimes in Afrikaans and so also. You can have a, a kind of bird, you can have a male bird, a mule, and you can also have a real horse, a bad bird. <laughs> Anybody of you who uses that? Have you heard it? That's the same in koi koi. A koi koi is a real person, is the prototypical person. And is not elitist. I'll tell you that tomorrow because Initially in the Cape, they just spoke about people. There was nobody else. And then later on came those Kurikoin, the white people and so on, and they came Bandu and so on. So they had to say, no, the real people, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's when they started saying Kurikoin. Right? Wait. Good. So that's the term, and not Kuku, as I said. Koikon Kovak simply means Koikon language. Kovak uh, means language, and not Kovak, please. Okay, good, it's good. Um, they make no difference between K and G. The letters are just used to indicate tones. Right. Um, now that name, I will tell you tomorrow, Koi Koi Kobab, was reintroduced officially in Namibia shortly after independence because my colleague, Pastor Elifas Eisen, with whom I worked for 20 years to compile dictionaries, he remembered one day after uh, pondering on this uh, problem for years. He remembered that he had heard his grandmother speak of a language called Wikogu. Mm -hmm. So I followed up in the literature and I found it. And it was reintroduced. Right? So now we come to the geographical distribution, I'm sorry, uh, of the languages. I'll first speak about the Ka, the northern Khoisan, as it was called, and then the Tu, and last about the Khoi, because that's what I understand we are most interested in here. Right. Um, so this map here is by Oswin Köhler, who worked in the Kavango since the 1950s amongst the Khoi of the Western Caprini, 
up here. He came every year to work there, and only as a student of uh, African languages did I realize that a girl that had been sitting for a few months in my class in Standard 1 was actually his daughter, <laughs> while he was in the Kavango doing his research. Now, this is the map that was included in the first one of his major books, that thick, that big, on the Quay of the Cabrini. This is the languages as they still exist today. All these white numbers were languages, but they extinct. So you see South Africa's white. He's not talking about the richest felt here. Again, here you have the yellow ones, the uh, uh, Ka languages, former here, he still calls it, okay, that it was Jew, because this one was not part of it yet. Uh, the brown ones is Kwekokova, Nama, Tamra, Kainkom up here, and there the Ngafwe, and this is the Botswana ones, Eastern and Western. Um, just to talk, give you an idea of a few of those languages, in, amongst the Ka languages. Here, uh, those, there is Junhua, and they're, they're Kong, they are closely related, you get different varieties of them, but it's the language, Junhua is the language with the most speech sounds of any language in the world. Depending on how you classify them, but they've got something like um, 24, uh, 48 clicks. <laughs> By comparison, Koifugoba has got 20. That means four basic clicks, each with five variants. Gives you 20, they have 48. They have 24 different vowels. English, if you take uh, short and long vowels, you, you come to half of that, 12, all right, by comparison. Uh, these, the, the phonology of this language was cracked, as we say, by a former colleague of ours, Jan Schneemann, who still worked in Windhoek who later went to UNISA. I'll come back to him later on. Now, these Angalin Kung, as I said, you see he does not give any there any longer. They moved into Namibia here, and then also to Plattfontein uh, near Kimberley. The South African military brought them down after the war because there might have been reprisals otherwise against their families. <coughs> Originally, they were in Schmidt Street. Um, Tony Trail, a very internationally renowned phoneticist, phonologist, specialized on the Kwama language here in central Botswana, Botswana near, near uh, Lone Tree. And um, now that Westphal was the first one to classify that also as a northern Khoisan language. This again, you see Westphal, and he was not very popular with that then. <coughs> Right, to come to the, just a summary of these languages again. Hatsa and Sandawe we can exclude, they are there in, in East Africa, Tanzania. Here you have Koi Kwadi again with the groups, uh, Koi, proper and or Koi Koi, let's say that is uh, in Namibia and that's Kalahari Koi and there are the other languages. Um, so it gives you about the information that we had in the other table. I won't go further into that. Now, when we come to the the two languages, um, here the last ones. You have only only one language that really is still spoken, and that is um, Kong in the Amunis corridor of Namibia, here about this area, and over here. All the others are extinct. There is one more language, uh, Kamani is also a name that you may have heard, where you may have seen that dictionary, Omar Gilmaid, uh, teaching in this picture dictionary and so on. There are three speakers, three sisters left. They don't live in the same place, so the language is not spoken for, used for communication any longer between people, because they, unless they get together. But I suppose now that she's teaching, and she also has that guy in the teaching, so they probably will now stop teaching at the 
Yeah. yeah, I can't say much about them. I've never been to them. I've been there. Yes. Okay, I haven't, so I'd rather not say anything about it. I just know of colleagues of the track. Um, the Ui languages, the most important one is Tam. Um, Tam was spoken just about in the entire Northern Cape, in the Karoo, and on a, in a large area. And um, Rick, when he, remember, he could not do field work because of his health. But he found out that there were prisoners in the breakwater prison here in the, uh, on, the, on the foreshore. And he worked with those prisoners. And uh, after they had finished their prison sentence, several of them stayed on with him in his house in Weinberg to tell him these stories. Now, he worked together with his sister-in-law, Lucy Lloyd. Blake died in, 19, in 1870 age 45 or so, and she carried on. They collected 11,000 handwritten pages of texts from these people. It's the biggest, I think it's still the biggest um, documentation of any Koyo Sun language, of, of folklore and so on. And there were another 11, uh, another 2,000 pages of photos, maps, and so on, which are also there in this archive. I want to recommend to you to go and have a look tomorrow. Um, Clark's bookshop here said they haven't got it here. They will bring it tomorrow. I bought one last year. I saw it for the first time. The book that Professor uh, Pippa Stone has brought out. She's at the Michael Ellis, Michael Ellis uh, School of Finance. About this digitalized archive, it's, the book itself is a piece of art. It's a fantastic book. So if you're interested, have a look there. They said they would bring a copy tomorrow. So, sorry, I've got a copy. Uh, I forgot to bring it. I'll bring it tomorrow. It's called Claim to the Country. That's right. I've, I've got a copy here, too. I didn't bring it. <laughs> Some people find it uh, offensive. Huh? There's a lot of, even when she had the exhibition at, uh, yep, at, the, at the art gallery, there were lots of tensions. And there is so much material that you will always find somebody who will have uh, some objections, I think. Right, now let's come to the last group, the Poe. Um, you want to ask some questions, perhaps I should finish. We, oh yes, I wanted to say the, the motto on the South African coat of arms is from the Tam language. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, come at all, it would be something like Bay A Karate, diverse people unite. I, there's a story by a, a linguist, and Alan Barnard, how they got a few days to come up with a motto. Um, anyway, so this is Tam, you say Tam. It's Tam. 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 It's like the English tap, 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 click, just the one line. Okay? And it is not related to the other languages, like, first of all, not to Khoi language at all, although there are influences on the Nama that was proved in the meantime, but they're not genetically from the same family. Um, okay, when we come back to, to these, that's the map of Kula again. The Khoi languages, here are the Kabribi languages, where Kula wrote these immense books and uh, then this is the one language where we also had to prove that it is not two separate languages. You remember that there's polemics between Nama and Damara. Uh, that's the Khoi language. The one other language which interests me very much is Naro here in Botswana on the Namibian border. Uh, it also gets prominence nowadays. There is a missionary who who translates the Bible and has done dictionaries on it and so on. Um, in other words, gets some literary prominence. Uh, in the eastern part of the Khoi languages, there is an interesting feature for linguists. It loses its click sounds and replaces them with sounds that and so on. Especially clicks like k and k, those which are more difficult to form. It replaces them. Right, now to come to Poikoro again. This is where the problem comes in that linguistic criteria and ethnic criteria must not be confused. Because 
This language, this so-called Khoi language, is spoken by three races, if you allow me to call it that. First of all, there are the Nama, which are Khoi as we say, all right? Then there are the Damra, who are, which are Negroid, like the Bantu. But remember, I told you before, you may never call them Bantu because they don't speak a Bantu language. Bantu is a linguistic term. And then you have got so-called Bushmen, who are Said, who also speak the language. Those hang from up here and the Alpred. In other words, you have Khoid, Negroid, and Said people speaking one and the same language, with dialect, right? That must not be confused. If you come to the numbers, this is the last really uh, still active language there. If I go by the, uh, the um, population statistics, Namibia has, should some, have something like 200, sorry, uh, 2.6 million people in the whole country. That's something like 3.1 person per square kilometer. It's only Mongolia where you have less people per square kilometer. It's mostly in Namibia. Um, so the Nama, the Bambus are about half of the population, 49%. The Damra and Nama, that means Khoibukova, is the next biggest group. They are 11%. All the others are down there. The next one after that is Afrikaans, and then you have something 9-8% and so on. Now, of these Khoibukova speakers, the Damara are 61% of the speakers. In other words, about, you can say, 170,000. The Nama are just about the remaining 40-39%, so they're about 120,000. Uh, you cannot deduct how many Akwe and Hengkong there are because they are listed under San. Again, the census there mixes up ethnic and linguistic criteria. And there they go together with Kung and Zhukwa and so on. And by now you should understand that they may not go together because they're different language families. In the media, you may not ask for ethnic identity. You may only ask for linguistic identity. That's constitutional. 